Moto America fans, it's time for another episode of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. You'll laugh, you'll cry, and you may even learn something from this unlikely pair and their special guest. The mic is yours, Paul and Sean. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest edition of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. I am Bice, uh, doing the intro this week, and I'm with my counterpart, the communications manager for Moto America, Paul Carruthers. Uh, and Paul, um, how are you doing out there on the West Coast? Uh, we're doing this a little earlier than we normally do. So, uh, how you feeling? I'm good. I'm, uh, I'm, as you know, I'm more of a morning person than an afternoon person. So doing it nice and early for me works out best. Um, no, I'm doing well. It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, coming into the weekend here. So should be a nice weekend and I'm looking forward to, uh, to chilling out a little bit. Uh, this week was nice. We had um, Wayne Rainey and Chuck Axlem were in the office. Uh, it's always good when those are guys, those guys are here. We can get together and have some meetings and kick stuff around and come up with good ideas and find out what bad ideas we've had. And it's been it's been kind of an it's been an interesting week. Obviously, everybody saw the uh, all the stuff with Ben Spees, and some of that was a little bit disappointing. But I think we got uh, I think everything got resolved in the end and. Everybody will move on and be the better for it. So, but yeah, it made things a little interesting. I know it uh, it caused a little stress for Wayne, but he, uh, he, as you know, he he tends to handle that stuff better than most people. So, it's uh, yeah, it, it all worked out okay. It's these situations. I always feel like I want to sit around a campfire and sing Kumbaya or something because the thing that troubles me more, and it, it not just with Ben, but we'll see it with fans too. And I mean, they are fans, and they say that the fan is actually a, a abbreviation of the word fanatic. And some people, you know, really are passionate about it. But the thing that drives me nuts is, you know, the fact that people really rip the series and I think it's come a long way. And I mean, we're sensitive to it. Of course, people are entitled to their opinions, but you kind of wish, you know, we all want American road racing to succeed. I believe that's true. So you want these fans and everybody to say, Hey, you know, there's some, bumps and things here along the road but you know we're definitely making it better it's clearly better than it was and can't you guys you know get behind it and i, I guess they're not going to always love it and they're entitled to their opinion but sometimes it just troubles me i wish i could just i don't know give them a big hug and say hey it's going to be okay we're going to get there so yeah um, and i mean it, it's tough. it's i i see it from their point sometimes you know i mean I, with all those years i spent at cycle news we were very critical of the ama and ama pro racing and the series and true i mean it, it, and it was kind of our job and i thought we did i thought we at least did a fair job of it um but it also it also showed me once i once i got into the inside of this deal that there's a lot more that goes on to it into it than people know you know looking at it from the outside and it's not an easy thing to uh to to do what we do as far as like putting this series on and, and, you know, I always had, I had this conversation with somebody yesterday and, and it was like, you know, I was here for the heyday of AMA pro racing and the Superbike series and all the entries and large crowds and, 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 and don't get me wrong. It was great, but you know, but I will argue with anybody that we run a better series than what was run back then. We just, it's, we're just not in that same era where we had, you know, the large spectator crowds and and you know all these factory teams with four factory riders but if you pick yeah. if you if you gave us that if you put our series in that time frame it would be better than what we even had then because i know this company does a better job of organizing the races i mean we you know at, at, there was times there was times when a schedule didn't even mean anything back then you know nobody knew when anything was going to start and i mean our, you know it seems like a simple process but you kind of take it for granted when there's actually a set schedule and everything goes off on time, you know, it's little things like that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it really you know, does. It really does work like a well-oiled machine. There's no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, sometimes it's hard, you know, you kind of take it personally when you're in, in this situation and you see the kind of effort that, that we don't have a very big group, as you know. So there's a lot of people that work extremely hard. And then Richard Varner mm -hmm. obviously spends a lot of money and puts a lot of resources into this. And then it's just kind of hard when you see some fan, you know, complain that, uh, you know, his free TV that day didn't work or whatever, or there was a boxing match on or there was soccer or something. It's, and it, I understand their frustration as well, but sometimes it's like, Ugh, you know, but, 
it uh it all works out and and you know we keep fighting along here and and you know i'm i continue to be proud every day of what we do here and 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 the people that matter and the people that are involved now are the ones that uh that ultimately have obviously get a little bit more respect from my side as far as you know i i just have a difficult time someone commenting on our series when they're not a part of it and they haven't been a part of it and they're not even regular visitors to it you know right right exactly knowledge helps but you know and and the thing is paul i mean we've talked about this before i mean you know with regard to your uh, where your background you know born into a racing family and you've had racing in your blood your whole life you've you know we're 30 years at cycle news and have been around this paddock a long time and you know i've been a i'd been a fan for a long time and then kind of kept pressing my nose against the glass and got kind of involved but you know i'm excited to talk to our guest who's on here today because he also has uh, a lot of perspective he can provide. He's raced for a long time. Um, and we're talking about Michael Barnes, who uh, is actually 50 years old, um, but still uh, very, very fast, um, as fast probably as he's always been. Um, a guy that has had an amazing career. I, I don't think, I, I can't think of another rider who's ridden more different makes and brands and types of motorcycles than Michael Barnes has. Um, and this year he's, he's racing in the twins cup class on a Ducati. I think it's a 797 monster, um, with Dale Quarterly's, uh, group and Bob Robbins who works with Dale. And, uh, you know, it's funny, Dale and Dale and Michael were teammates at one time together. And I, I don't have a lot of information about it. So it's something I want to ask Michael about. So let's bring him in. Michael, uh, coming all the way from Boca Raton. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure, guys. How you guys doing? Doing really we're, well. We're hanging in there. Yeah. Right, right on. Glad, glad to have you with us, Michael. Um, you know, tell us about, we've talked to you a little bit about this, what you're doing this year with, with Dale, but, you know, I, I want to ask you, we had Dale on before, and Dale told us, told us some great stories of his uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle days when he was sponsored by Mirage Studios, but you guys, you guys were actually teammates at one time. Um, what, what team was that, and what did you ride? Uh, we were teammates on the on the EBSCO Suzuki at one point. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, not a, not full season, but there was some seats being swapped around, and and Dale and I rode together one time. Did did you? I mean, you you guys have always known each other. Um, you kind of raced in parallel. You know, he was one place, you were another place along the way, but you obviously have known him a long time. And did you have a relationship with Bob Robbins before this too? No, uh, Bob, Bob, uh, Bob, and, and my relationship kind of uh, more so took off this year with the Ducati. Um, you know, I've he's been more of an acquaintance over the years, and with his affiliation with Dale Quarterly, I've you know I've known of, of him, and um, you know Dale's Dale's just got such a great program, and uh, you know being that that tuner racer himself, he's just uh, he's a wealth of information and knowledge and. And, uh, you know, great for these kids for the on-track development program that he has going and, and, and also to help out with my, uh, my Ducati effort. Well, I was, I was impressed with Michael. I've been impressed with Michael for a long time for many reasons. One of the main reasons is he just seems like he's one of those guys that you could call him up and say, hey, I've got this, you know, 1957 Manx Norton and I need you to race it, you know, and blah, 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 and he'd show up and do well. Or you could call him and say, hey, I've got a brand new R1. I need you to race it in a superbike class in China. And he'd go over there and do well. So it's, it's, he's just one of those guys. It's kind of like, um, it's almost like I'm, I always feel that I feel a little bit like that with Larry Pegram too. It's like the guy can be gone forever and, you, and he comes up and he shows up on a superbike and he runs in the top 10 or something, you know, or he goes to a dirt track and he not only qualifies, but he runs in the top 10. And, and it's, I think there's those two, those, those kind of guys, there, there's not a lot of them. And I think it's just, I think they gain that from, from the fact that they've, they've done it so many times before on so many different bikes that I think it just makes them so that they can adapt really easily to, to things. But what, what, what I thought was kind of cool this year is obviously Michael showed up at Road Atlanta and you know, he's so hard to keep track of what he's actually doing. I was surprised that he hadn't been doing anything. You know what I mean? Like he shows up and, and he'd, he'd been at Daytona in what March of 2018. 
and then he shows up at our race in April of 2019, and he hadn't raced any time in between that, and then he goes out and wins the race. So, kind of cool. <laughs> and I mean, it it's seems like cool. it seems like every every story like when I was when I was doing a little research on him, every story that comes up, it's like. Oh, Michael Barnes comes out of retirement and wins the blah, blah, blah. Michael <laughs> Barnes comes out of retirement and wins the blah, blah, blah. So it always seems like you're retired until you're not. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep trying, but <laughs> it's hard to stay away. And, uh, you know, I've just always been so passionate about this sport. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. All the people are so much fun to be around. And, and I think that's what I miss most. Uh, more so than the racing is being around the people, you know, it's not the same people anymore, but you know, there's a, there's a few OGs around and, you know, which reminds me of Mike Smith and he was the original uh, yeah, uh, right. go-to guy with the number nine one one, you know, call, call right. Mike Smith, call Mike Smith in an emergency, call nine one one, which was his number on his, you know, when he came in and filled in uh, on a few different teams, I, you know, I remember him running the nine eleven on the, uh, on the, on the Harley as well. So, yeah. What what's the hardest part when you when you do come back, um, it, and you go and you roll out in that first practice session? I mean, I know what it's like when you haven't ridden in a while. It just it seems like it's just it, it, the physical part of it's fine. I mean, it's muscle memory, et cetera. But it just doesn't it take you a while just for your brain to like catch back up to the actual speed of things? Yeah, I'd imagine if I was hopping on a super bike. Yeah, but. Um... You know, to to hop on the lightweight bike and and uh, on on tracks I'm familiar with, it's 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 kind of a little bit easier than getting thrown into the wolves and the you know with all the top 600 guys or or a super bike ride. But uh, as much as I'd still like to be riding those classes, I you know that that that's a that's a bit tougher and a little bit more of a tall order. I I, I can still be competitive on a 600, I'm pretty sure, but. But yeah, I don't think so on the super bike. That 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 takes some uh, some vigorous training to get ready for that. Barney, what do you do um, between racing? I mean, I, I actually don't know what your day sort of job is. I know you've you've done a lot in your life, and it's always related to motorcycles. What what do you do other than that, or what do you do in addition to that? Uh, right now, I'm just in that transitionary period of what to do after this. Um, you know, I, I, I dabble in some real estate stuff and um, just been working on, on one house pretty diligently trying to trying to rent this and, and move up towards Daytona. I'm kind of trying to get out of South Florida and the busyness of, of down here. And so, um, you know, my my recent engagement to Ann Roberts, uh, we're, we're really looking forward to uh, uh, cooling down a few degrees. Um, you know, you mostly feel it during the winter, you know, it's a little bit cooler up there, but, uh, just looking for a little bit of land and some breathing room. And, um, you know, I've got some good opportunities up there as far as work. And, um, you know, other than that, I do a little bit of coaching here and there and yeah, just try to stay busy as much as possible. You know, you mentioned your engagement to Anne, and I, you know, I've known about her as a writer. I uh, see see her show up at certain events, but I I didn't know until you this year when you thanked her on the podium, and then I saw her working with you in the paddock, and I I didn't realize that you guys were even together. Um, you probably met at the racetrack, I would imagine. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I was actually coaching her, <laughs> and um, you know, a couple other riders back in. Uh, I guess I, I stopped riding full time in '14 after the uh, the Veloce MV year. That's right. And, and uh, so I think it was I think it was '15 that that I started working with Ann, and uh, yeah, and we we quickly became an item at, you know towards the end of that year. That's terrific. Can you have a date set for your marriage yet? No, not not etched in stone, but we're we're looking to looking to do it sometime this year. That's cool. And she, she's been, I've seen her, she's been, she's essentially part of your crew and helping you now, right? Oh, she's been, she's been incredible and instrumental in, in, in making this easy and, uh, and, and, and fun. And she's just so on top of things when, when we're at the racetrack, she's, she's always catching stuff that, that, uh, other people are missing. She's really on the ball and it's a pleasure to have her at the racetrack with me. 
really uh that's great i wish wish i had had her for years <laughs> <laughs> what what's it like to be on that team and you know you've got obviously jamie astadio and and dallas um i sit to you know sometimes i'll go by that paddock and i, I love dale quarterly so much i mean he's a terrific guy but sometimes when he's sitting talking to those guys, I, I get a little scared. I mean, he can be pretty intense. <laughs> I, I saw him coaching up uh, uh, Dallas one day, essentially telling him, this is your race, you know? And I'm like, it seemed like it was a Rocky movie I was watching. I'm thinking, well, you guys are teammates and you're kind of contemporaries. Does, does he say much to you? And what's it like for you to be part of that team where there's such a disparity of ages? I mean, do you help that those guys a little bit as well? Um, yeah, pretty much Dale has most of that covered, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's, you know, really the, uh, the professor on the team and, and, uh, I'm, I'm back to student when it's, when it comes to working with Dale, he's, he's just so knowledgeable and, um, uh, and so passionate, uh, when he, when he gets into, uh, into race mode, uh, he's always looking for, to, to help the program, to make the bike better. And, you know, it could be, it could be anywhere. We were. I went to watch Danny Eslick do uh, the flat track race when we were in, in Wisconsin and and Dale was over there and walking through the pits and I was sitting there talking to Danny and before long he was grabbing a wrench and, you know, changing stuff on Danny's bike. Oh, we got to do this. We got to do this. We got to, you know, this is going to be better. I, I promise you. I mean, changing, <laughs> changing shocks. And I mean, it was, it was great to, great to watch, but that's, that's how Dale is. He's uh He's just, like I said, just a wealth of information that, that his experience and on on any motorcycle, and it it also rolls over from his car racing and to his car racing. So he's a lot of fun to work with, and uh, you know, just having known him all these years, it's it it's it's pretty cool. Hey, tell us a little bit. Um, backing up to your career was. I mean, you you won you won the Daytona 200 when you were 47. Was is how does that rank as far as is your career? Is that the biggest win you've had? Yeah, it it was it was pretty pretty huge. Um, you know that I guess some other memorable wins. You know would have to you know be the the Harley Championship just prior to that. You know that was in 2012 and. Um, you know that was that was pretty huge because that was my first sort of solo AMA championship, and uh, so that'd been something that I'd been trying to trying to go after and trying to achieve since I started racing AMA back in the in '89. So, uh, but the Daytona, you know, the Daytona win was huge. Um, you know, granted, it's it's not what it used to be, but uh, you know, still still quite competitive and and and, and still a a challenging endurance race for for you know team bike and rider so i'm really really proud of that that win and uh, who knows i may may be out and try and do another one again but funding's kind of hard to find these days <laughs> yeah but i mean the thing is like you said i mean you might have won it when it wasn't in its heyday but i mean i think the thing that gives that a little bit more credibility was the fact that you've done it so many times when it was what it was you know so um I, I, I'm sure that also made it special. It's, and, and again, the fact that you're from down that way, Florida way, and, and, and I know that you've been in that race many, many times. So I, I thought, when actually when I watched it on Fans Choice, I'm like, that, that's really cool that that guy won that race. You know, it's one, of those, hmm. it's one of those events that a guy like you should win, you know? So it was cool. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I, I've logged quite a few miles of Daytona, and, and uh, not as far as the Daytona 200 is concerned. I think I have like 13 or something like that. But uh, yeah, the, the amount of endurance races that I did at Daytona, you know, really, that's what that's what makes uh, makes it a little easier on me to get through traffic and and to just come out and be competitive on that track because I just have so many miles logged on at, at Daytona. Michael, so let's talk about 2012. That was a, a pretty amazing deal for you. I mean, you you uh, it was your first, I believe, it was your first career AMA Pro number one plate. You won the championship in AMA Pro Harley Davidson, and it was a close. Close, uh, close championship, no closer than it got at NOLA. And, uh, you know, people remember that, uh, but some people might not, or younger, younger listeners, or some of these junior cup kids may not know what went on there. And, you know, can you recount that and tell us leading into that and what happened at that race that's made it so interesting? 
Yeah, well, we had a really tight tight points uh, race, Tyler and I, going into the final round at NOLA. Um, I think Tyler O'Hara, you mean? Yep. Yeah, Tyler O'Hara. And prior prior to that was uh, the Homestead race, which um, which I had won. But prior to Homestead was New Jersey, which was where Kyle Wyman got hurt, and uh, he would have he would have been definitely the you know a strong title contender going into those last two rounds as well, but. Uh, he had that big get off at Jersey coming onto the front straightaway. And uh, on that last lap, I came from, from sixth place up to, up to fifth. I think I was fifth going into that last little S's going to the start finish. And that's when Kyle had his big get off. And I think, uh, both Benny Carlson and, um, and, uh, had somebody, somebody else, they, they rolled out of it and I, I ended up getting, getting, by those guys and finishing second to uh to Shane Narbone who who won that weekend a, a stellar win he was pretty untouchable but it was uh it was a really really super competitive race and to come out of there some good points it really set me up to go to Homestead and then we won Homestead and then it was you know down to whoever won NOLA between Tyler O'Hara and myself so you know we had been going back and forth and there there was a, a red flag and restart to the race and uh you know we battled right down to the line as you can remember and for those that don't remember you know we had a last lap incident where where tyler tried to get a little dirt track toe off of me onto the front straightaway and uh you know i can't say that i wouldn't have tried to do the same thing had i known that i was going to be beat to the line on with that championship on the line so you know tyler's an incredible competitor and you know i got all the respect in the world for him and you know there's never been any hard feelings over that that incident but um yeah, it it cost him the championship, and I and I got the championship that weekend. Well, let me let me just say this: a dirt track move for people don't know or don't remember. Tyler literally literally reached over, grabbed you, I think, by the shoulder, and almost like pulled himself forward to try to get a gap to the line on that. And that, that's pretty much what happened, wasn't it, Michael? Yeah, yeah. On the on the previous lap, I had maybe you know maybe a mile an hour on him going to the line, so he kind of knew that I had a tiny bit on him. And uh, and I think he saw that unfolding on the last la- or on the last corner, going to the line, and and uh, he just reached out and just like uh, just wanted to grab grab onto something. So he, I think a friend, I think it was Pegram who put it worse, put it put it best. He's like, uh, he goes, if you were falling a, on falling off a cliff, wouldn't you reach out and grab something either? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> what was it what's it like to race in a series and you know you've been on so many bikes but the fact that you were ra- essentially that was a spec series you're on equally pretty much equally uh prepared bikes although obviously tuners had something to do with that but um what it's it's all down to your talent and racecraft in those situations isn't it yeah well most of the time you know you'll you'll see the same thing in 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 moto two you know you you've got some really competitive you know motorcycles that are you know supposedly equal but you know teams have better funding better electronics better this better that more testing um you know so you you still have some bikes that are better than others and as as much as a organization tries to police the rules uh, there's there's usually a better bike out there and you know, towards the end of the season, when I got on Kyle's bikes, Kyle's bikes were in that category of the the better bikes. Um, you know, really, the, the the Josh Chisholm racing bikes were the Bartels bikes. Those were super competitive, and and uh, Suburban Harley Davidson they were super competitive. But you really had to be you know on your game in that class, uh, you know, on the tuning aspect to to be there every single weekend. But it is super, super fun to race in, in a spec series because it does take a lot of the uh, the unfairness out of the game and right. you know, p- puts everybody on, on a e- more equal level. This is probably a difficult question considering how many bikes you have ridden. But is there, <laughs> of all the things you have ridden, is there anything that stands out in your mind as like, okay, that thing was just really fun to ride or, or something else that made it stand out as, you know, a little bit above the rest? Oh, definitely. I mean, I've, the, I've ridden some pretty unique motorcycles. You know, I was, when I raced for uh, 
Michael Canapa on the 10K racing, Harley Davidson. He also owned a Britain. So I got to race the Britain at Daytona and a Super Mono. And those were both just, you know, so much fun to ride. You know, incredible honor to ride the Britain as well. And I also got to throw a leg over the uh, uh, Rob Tolui's Tolaris. Which Tell was, us uh, about yeah. that one, Michael. I was going to bring that one up. You got to explain to people what that <laughs> thing was. So that's yeah. amazing. It's uh, like an 800 two-stroke. Um, that thing was just a beast. It, 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 it was, he basically built a motorcycle out of a, a Polaris motor, a you know, two-stroke snowmobile Polaris motor, and he built a transmission for it. Um, he built the, built the bike, you know, the, the swing arm. I think, he's, I think he said that the swing arm actually took more hours than the transmission did. Um, but you know, to give you an idea of what it was like to ride the bike, it it had an increase of fifty horsepower between five thousand and fifty five hundred RPM. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, it it was literally a a light switch, and you had to have that thing on its way up to the meat of the tire when you when you you know hit that power band coming out of a coming out of the horseshoe at Daytona because it would just light the rear tire up and wheelie and. Um, and they, you were just along for the ride after that, but yeah, that was, that was a pretty neat thing to do. And, you know, I've, I've ridden some really, really cool super bikes over the years, you know, mostly the, the really good super bikes I've been able to ride have been in Macau, but, um, as far as the unique ones, that was definitely the Britain and the Tolaris. And, and those were both a huge honor to be able to, to throw a leg over. Interesting similarity about those two bikes too. The fact that certainly not in the one was a obviously a four stroke one thousand V twin. The other was like you said this eight hundred cc snowmobile engine. But they both. I thought it was interesting that they both had the radiator uh, kind of flat under the seat. Is that correct? Yeah, hard to remember. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm not going to remember where yeah. radiators are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about the Tolaris because the the Tolaris had the two pipes going out the back like an old TV. Yeah, uh, right. So I don't know. Yeah, I can't, it, I, I I can't remember was, the radiator. I think the radiator was up above that, as I recall. But yeah, it was straight out the back. The the pipes on that. And the interesting thing about that was, uh, you know, they were you kind of were riding those bikes sort of around the same era. It seems like right with the Britain and then that. Were they around the same time? Yeah, I believe so. I rode the I rode the Britain, I think ninety six and ninety seven. Um, actually, one year I I only rode the Britain one year. I think no, I rode the Britain t two years because I finished finished second to Stroud. Right in Daytona. Yeah, and then I and then I won it the next year. I think when then when you, he wasn't when won. he wasn't there. That's right, and you were on that as you said that Canepa or Canepa, uh, which. Um, and you, man, you raced a, you raced the VR 1000, you raced the 250 GP bike. I mean, you really were all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think something like 13 brands, it's kind of hard to, <laughs> hard to uh, even recall them, but yeah, I think it's something like 13 brands I've, I've raced. That's wow. incredible. That's really something. And then, and then to mention the, the, the people he's raced against, for example, I mean, he goes back to, you know, it, it's three decades of racing and then and then now it's funny like at uh at utah he's on the podium with uh with this connor mcdonald kid who i'm not sure i've cooper. ever seen anybody cooper, more yeah. or cooper cooper mcdonald my, yeah. my apologies for that but i don't think i've ever seen anybody more excited to be on a podium than that kid and you know is it you haven't got to the point where you've raced against anybody's grandson yet right <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I really want to think about that one too much, but yeah, I've, I've, I've raced against, against, against a bunch of fathers and father and sons over the course of my career. And, you know, the, the, the podium with Cooper was a lot better than the podium that I had with Sam because this, the podium I had with Sam was the GTU endurance race at road America. And we got together on the last lap going into turn five and, and uh, yeah, we we were wanting to scrap on the podium. So, oh, really? Oh, that's yeah. Yeah. But that's so that that's was a little different. Ended, that's when we uh, we we became we became friends after that. You know, we came up. He came up, and we had a couple words, and uh, we've been buddies ever since. But to see Cooper up there was 
was really awesome. And there's, I've never seen somebody more excited to be on a podium ever. So I'm just yeah. had, really stoked for him. Yeah, that was something to see. And as, as Paul said, I mean, he was r super excited, but as excited as he was, it was cool to see that you were equally excited for him. It seemed like you just were tickled about that. It was, it was great, great to see that. So now I understand the sort of reason for that. You know, you, you literally have seen his whole life kind of, yeah, it's something. Well, I know, I know the feeling of, of that, that first podium. I know the feeling of that first win and, and I'll, I'll never forget those. It's uh you know, those are the, the best moments of, of racing are those, those, those epic milestone moments in your career. And uh, I'm sure he'll, he'll remember that for the rest of his life. You know, and you seem to be pretty excited when um, uh, Drake Beecham won too. And tell us a little bit about the, the we've talked often with the tw tw Twins Cup riders and also about the camaraderie that exists in that class. Um, you seem to be pretty you know when you came in it was funny when you raced at road atlanta everybody was kind of like oh my god michael barnes on that bike there's you know he's it's just he's he's going to dominate everybody and it's come back to be obviously competitive right now but by the same token you seem pretty happy when some of those other guys win if it's not cooper it's drake or you know tell us about the feeling you have of being in that class well, I mean, it is it is a really neat class with uh with these a lot of the kids coming from the junior cup and 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 moving up to uh, to another class and and honing their racecraft more and more. Um, you know, it might have looked like I was gonna be a lot more, uh, you know, win a lot more when I after after Atlanta. But I'm telling you, these kids learn more and more every single race. And and uh, you know, Alex Dumas is another example that. You know he's really starting to polish his uh, his whole game, and and he's getting tougher and tougher to beat. So, um, you know we're gonna have to do our homework and 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 see what we can do to make our bike a little bit better, and um, see what we have for them in this last half of the season. And you're doing the full season, right? You you're all in to, till the end at this point. Uh, that's that's the intention. You know, as, as long as we don't, you know. As long as we don't destroy a bunch of equipment and 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 it become unfeasible, un, un, unfeasible, you know. But it's uh, we're hoping to. It's been a race by race basis right now, and and uh, we're going to go out to the West Coast, and you know, we 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 enter one race after we finish one, so we're still doing it race by race, and but I, we pretty much have the intention of of completing the season. That's great. So one race at a time really has a whole new meaning to you because it's actually factual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it, um, you know, some, I, I, I do have uh, some recent support from the Palm Beach Police Foundation who, who sponsored me in the Daytona 200 the last, uh, the last three years, um, 16, 17 and 18, and also sponsored Pat Mooney on my bike this year, um, as well as the TOBC team. So, you know, I do have some good support for that and that's going to help me get to the races and, and, uh, Bob Robbins and Dale quarterly, they kind of handle the, the motorcycle and the team, and all the logistics behind that. So it really makes my job easy. And, and, uh, so ho hoping to, hoping to win some races here and, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully enough to win another championship. Does that Palm beach police sponsorship come with a get out of, jail free card or no yeah, yeah as, as long as long as you're in palm beach county yeah okay good i, just, <laughs> I, I didn't um, think it would work in monterey but <laughs> um, uh, yeah. my, my, michael i wanted to ask you so you are pretty much known as a floridian but one of the other things you have in common with with Dale is you're actually originally from New England. I b think you were born in Norwalk, Connecticut, or at least somewhere in Connecticut. How how long did you live in New England or in Connecticut before you went to Florida? I see. I was born in born in Norwalk, Connecticut, and was there for about four years until I was about four years old. And then my father, who was an airline pilot uh, for Pan Am at the time, uh, he was. He was uh, based in based at JFK, but we moved to Mexico for five years, and uh, wow. I lived in Mex Mexico for five years from the ages of uh, four to nine, and that's where I first rode a dirt bike. I didn't have a dirt bike there, but that's where I first rode a dirt bike was in Mexico, and then and then we moved back to Connecticut, and that's when I started riding dirt bikes a little bit more. Nothing 
race wise or anything like that just riding in trails and having fun on on dirt bikes but um and then we moved to florida when i was i think 13 or so wow what was your first what was your first road race uh first road race was august 87 at at uh palm beach and what were you what were you riding and how old were you let's see i was uh just prior to my just prior to my 19th birthday i think okay and i was riding a, a, a the new honda hurricane at the time oh wow yeah yeah. Paul, you, so. Paul, you ask him about Mexico. I uh, go ahead. Yeah. Did did you? I mean, if four to nine, you had to. You went to school there. Yep. Yep. I went to school there and uh, spoke fluent Spanish and really didn't speak English that well when we moved back to the United States. But uh, that that slowly came back around and and the Spanish slowly disappeared. But I can still understand a bit and get my point across if I need to. Oh, that's crazy. That's, That's awesome. amazing. It's funny. It's funny how when you're younger, you can pick up on languages pretty, pretty easily. Um, and, uh, but, it, but they go away when you get older. I mean, we've talked with Paul about that, even with his uh, Australian accent, how he's, it's pretty much gone at this point, you know, as he's gotten older. Yeah. I think my mom told me that, that it, and within two months I was speaking fluent Spanish when we moved down there. Wow. wow. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 Do you remember? Do you remember much about being in Mexico? About living there? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, uh, I, I played a lot of tennis when I was younger, so that's where that's where I started playing tennis, and and tennis was really big for me up in in Connecticut as well, and uh, and then moving down to Florida was was exciting for me because I you know I didn't have to I didn't have to play tennis in the winter indoors <laughs> you know it was just nice nice year round and right and uh yeah when played tennis in high school and but i also rode dirt bikes and and then the the tennis kind of got burnt burnt out on the tennis and you know just started riding riding dirt bikes a little bit more and bought my first street bike in 87 i was i was going to Embry riddle in daytona and that's that's when I bought the the first hurricane was up in Daytona Beach. You know, it's interesting for a guy who's ridden as long as you have. I mean, it's a little bit similar, you know, to Josh Hayes' story. He didn't start racing until he was like 18 or 19 either. I'm sure he rode bikes before that, but he kind of got a street bike and went from there for this dirt bike riding that you did. It, you didn't enter into it at an early age, but of course there wasn't Junior Cup when you started, right? I mean, that's probably part of the reason. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's a whole different opportunity for kids these days. You know, it's, I mean, imagine if we had road racing as a as a school curriculum, how many how many more fast kids would come out of it? Um, you know, there's there's just a lot of people that that don't know that they would be you know a super competitive motorcycle racer without actually trying it. Um, yeah, and that goes for goes for any sport really. Uh, if you just you know get in there and and put your time in and hone your hone your craft, you're you know there's a good chance that you're going to be good at it. Boy, I like your idea about adding road racing to the curriculum in school. That would be, <laughs> that would be something. Yeah, yeah. When they leave biology and go to flat track flat track <laughs> class. <laughs> That's right. That's good. Okay, so you're 11 points ahead. We've obviously got a few rounds left. We just passed the halfway mark. Is uh, I mean, you still got a, you're still confident about winning this championship. Obviously, I mean, you won the first two races, and like Sean said a little earlier, it's like, oh man, he's going to win every race. Well, that hasn't proven to be true, but you've been competitive in every race, so um, that you got to feel like this is an opportunity to win another championship. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, going going to the. Uh the next couple of races in California, you know, it's, this is, this is a pretty pivotal time. You got to make sure you score some points and, um, and, and strong points, you know, uh, uh Alex Dumas has been catching me the last couple of races and I, I have to, I have to kind of put an end to his catching me in points so I can keep that, keep him at bay. And, um, you know, plenty of other competitive riders in the class between, you know, Drake and, and Chris Turner and, you know, Cooper McDonald showing, a lot of promise and that uh, that young guy Chris Parrish. 
Uh, he's just the whippersnapper. <laughs> yeah, young the young guy, Chris, Chris Parrish and Curtis Murray. There's two of those <laughs> yeah, Curtis guys. Murray, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, re it's really neat. You know, it's, it's neat to have the, the, the age differences, you know, so, so the young guys can race with the old guys and learn something and, and catch up to them. And, and then the older guys are pushed by the younger guys who are, you know, so tenacious and and uh, and and driven and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It's really reminiscent of the of the Harley class in a way. I still think it's a great stepping stone between you know Junior Cup and and uh, Super Sport because we don't have Super Stock six hundred anymore, and it seems to be borne out by the fact that you know Alex uh, he you know started out and obviously had to learn it, but now as you said, he's coming on like gangbusters at this point. So I think it's a good stepping stone for him, don't you agree? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and to be uh, to be affiliated with uh, you know with with the M4 team, uh, you know, he really has some some good opportunities in the future. You know, so he wins the championship. Who who knows what the deal is with him? You know, is he going to go right into a 600? Um, you know, it'd be, it'd be neat. It'd be, it's really going to be neat to watch and, and watch these young guys. You know, you know, hone their hone their skill over the years. So you're 50 years old. This is a question I have. You're, you're 50 years old and, and you know, you're- I know, you keep saying that. You, you're, well, <laughs> it's because you're close to our age, that's why. <laughs> yeah, it is. It makes me, it makes me, well, it doesn't make me feel better because I'm older, but still, it makes me feel like there's a chance. But you're, so you, at, at, at your young, youthful age, you're, you're firing it off into turn one and there's a 16 year old next to you. Does it cross your mind ever that like, hey, this kid's 16 and he may be willing to do something that I'm not or or just the racer thing take over and you don't even think about him? Yeah, I really, I mean, I, I think self-preservation is is a, a little bit more uh, um, working for me today than it was a long time ago, you know, over the years. I, I'm a little bit more careful, you know, I, I really don't want to get hurt, so... Uh, but yeah, it doesn't really change when you, when the visor goes down, you know, just try to get in turn one first and try to get away from everybody. But I haven't been getting really good starts on the Ducati. So it's been making my, my job a little bit tougher, but we're going to work on that. And the two tracks we're coming up to Laguna Seca and Sonoma, obviously you've ridden every track in the country probably, but are those two tracks that, uh, that you'd look forward to, or is, or is that not the case? Um, actually, yeah, no, I am looking forward to them. You know, any, any sort of a more technical track is going to be a little bit more suited to, uh, to me at this point, because I need, I need all the advantage I can get, whether it be from experience or, uh, uh, you know, I guess mainly from experience from having ridden the tracks before and, and, and being able to get up to speed quickly. But, you know, these, these kids are, these kids are on, on the gas, you know, they're, they're, they're showing some fast times early in the weekend and uh, definitely keeping me honest. What's your favorite track that we go to here in the U.S. and on the Moto America schedule, Michael? Hmm. It's kind of hard, hard to say, you know. It's, you know, I, I've had my, my favorite tracks and then not so favorite tracks, but, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the atmosphere has a lot to do with it. You know, Laguna is just such a huge, huge deal. And, um, you know, really, really enjoy Road America, um, but it's a little boring on a on a twin, right? Um, you know, Barber is Barber is just one of the one of the neatest tracks too, and that, and that ought to suit the suit the twins really well. So yeah, as far as a favorite track, it's kind of hard to hard to pinpoint a a, a favorite track. Uh, I have I have favorite tracks. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense for some of these ridden as long as you have i can understand why and especially on different bikes it would probably depend on what bike you're on to what track you pick as your favorite um what one thing you with paul mentioned about you know going into a corner and your preservation and i could be completely wrong about this but my perception of you is you have not had what i would consider to be a lot of injuries in your career am i wrong about that and you just didn't really say much about it what do you think uh, you know, for the, I guess for the amount of crashes I've had, I haven't been injured much. Um, right. You know, I have definitely had my fair share of crashes, and um, but you know, I've had a lot of 
collarbone breaks and wrist breaks and you know the the, the broken leg from the Vegas deal years ago in 96. Oh, that's right. You know, that was probably one of the biggest ones. And and I'd probably say the, the most pivotal one for my career was when I broke my wrist uh, at Sonoma in 2007 when I was on M4. And, you know, that was really I was really at the top of my game when that happened. And, um, you know, was really was really looking forward to put putting it to Josh Hayes in that Formula Extreme race that that day. And I had a, a incident on a warm up lap and had a, just a huge high side and destroyed my wrist and I was out for for the remainder of that year. Um, so you know, I I think yeah, I, I haven't had a lot of injuries. You know, looking back on, on it, but you know those those concussions sure add up over the years and and that's what really led me to to stop full time racing in 2014. But because um, I had felt the effects of of a concussion I had at Laguna for for about two or three months after where usually, you know, you'll feel effects of a concussion for about a week or so, maybe two weeks. Um, but this one really kind of affected me badly. And, and, uh, but I was able to come back from that and, you know, do the Daytona races and, and then this opportunity to ride the twin that road Atlanta came up and I was like, yeah, okay, well, it sounds like it'd be fun. And, you know, it's not like it's going to be a full-time deal or anything. And, then, and here yeah, we go. But, and here we go again. But, <laughs> um, you know, so that's, you know, not saying anything bad about any other helmet companies, but that's what led me to, to, uh, to switch to the 6D helmets, you know, with their technology and, and what they have available for, for the rider, you know, pr protection wise for the head, um, you know, the 6D helmets is, uh, is the next, next best thing or is the next best thing. Um, so you know, I feel a little bit safer, you know, having, having that little extra protection and, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that we're going to see more and more safety things come, come to light over the years, which would be, which would be a godsend. And you've worn Tai Chi leathers forever, right? I mean, have, how long have you been wearing leathers for, from them? Uh, Audrey from Moto Liberty has been helping me out since, uh, well, you know, all the way back to the Moto Liberty days, you know, yes. we were on, on, on Nankai back then, but um, I'm pretty sure I've been wearing the Tai Chi since about 2000, 2003 or four is when I started. And then I wasn't on them while I was on a couple different teams. And then I could always go back. She's, she's always been very supportive and, uh, and, and been able to help me in Tai Chi's, uh, they they just build such a great suit and super comfortable and I'm actually getting a new suit. Looking forward to that here soon with an airbag. That's oh cool. great, yeah. yeah, really good. All right, I think um, I think the three of us at our extended age might need a nap soon, so I'm gonna uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll end this and we can go have some warm soup and maybe curl up on the couch or something. So. I uh, I appreciate I appreciate you being with us today, Michael. It was it's always fun talking to you, and it's uh, it's a pleasure having you back in the paddock. I think um, I don't know I can't I can't picture you ever not being there at this point. So it's uh, it's good to have you there. And Sean, thanks for uh, for hooking all this up again today and uh, and joining us. And I want you guys to both have a good weekend. And uh, to all our fans out there, thanks for listening to this. And I hope we. Uh, we buy some tickets to Laguna Seca and buy some tickets to Sonoma and come out to the races and, and see what Moto America is all about. So, again, thank you guys for, for joining in, and uh, we'll catch up with you again soon, and, and we'll see you at Laguna in a couple of weeks, Michael. Very good. Thanks, Paul. It's a pleasure talking to you guys. And, Sean, thanks again uh, for thinking of me with this, and look forward to seeing you guys out west. All right, thanks, guys. Barney. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Take care.